My name is Taryn Iwamura. I am currently a PhD student in mechanical engineering at Carnegie Mellon University, and I did my undergrad degree in engineering physics with a focus in electromechanical systems design at Stanford. Yeah. So how did you get into Stanford? So I actually grew up in a pretty small town in Arkansas, and actually I hadn't really heard of Stanford before a very close friend of mine um, got accepted the year before me. So I heard about it through them and they, both them and my mom encouraged me to apply. I visited to see my friend and thought that it was just a ridiculously cool place with incredible people um, and really fun people as well, but I didn't think that I would get in, but they kind of encouraged me because they're like, oh, it's better to, try, you know, that's the sort of thing where you hang the rejection letter. Um, so try because you know that you'll never, um, they're like, you'll, you'll really regret it if you don't at least give it a shot. Um, so they definitely believed me at the, in me at the time more than I did um, back in high school. But so I applied and the essays actually ended up being, they were really fun to write. Like they were questions that made me really kind of reflect and think about myself. So for me, they were fun to write. Um, and then, yeah, like they, I found out actually, like I was so sure I wasn't going to get in that I was actually at a party that my family had been throwing me to celebrate me getting into another school. And the joke is, I was like, oh yeah, I'm waiting to commit until I get my Stanford rejection. And then at that party, I actually got the acceptance email and my family was like really cool about it because they were like, oh, she's going to Stanford. And yeah, they basically just like switched the entire, the entire party after. Yeah, so did you apply to universities of same caliber? At that I, time? Yeah, so I had applied to MIT because like I said, I kind of came from a pretty small town, so I didn't really know many of the big name schools. Um, like I heard of Stanford through my friend, I heard of MIT through my uncle. And so those are two that I had applied to. Um, but other than that, you know, I applied to University of Arkansas, the local school, and I'd applied to Case Western, which was one that, which was a school in Cleveland where some of my family had been from. Um, then I think I applied to Georgia Tech. I didn't apply to many places for undergrad, mostly because I had only applied to schools that I kind of was familiar with. Yeah, so what what did you do in high school? Like oh, what did I do in high school? Well, my high school journey was kind of non-traditional. Um, my first two years, I went to the local um, public school in my hometown. And it was a lot of fun. You know, I had a really close group of friends that I played in the orchestra in. And I, because I've played violin since I was a really little kid. Um, I think three or maybe no, four. I was probably like four or five or something. Um, but yeah, so I played violin with a type group of friends through orchestra and I played tennis and stuff but my school didn't have the greatest program in math and science um, and it was the sort of thing where I I didn't know what I wanted to do but I knew I wanted to I knew I like I liked STEM um, and I wanted to learn more about it and also the arts and stuff like I wanted to go to somewhere that had a really strong program in that and so I actually found this school through a family friend in Hot Springs, Arkansas, called the math, Arkansas School for Math, Science, and the Arts. And it was about three hours away from my hometown. So in my sophomore year, I applied to that school and got accepted. And it was like a, it was kind of like a magnet school. It was like a public boarding school because if you got accepted, it was free for you to go because they wanted to stop the Arkansas brain drain. And they wanted to give students who wanted to study more um, a good opportunity because Arkansas is like, it's pretty low. Like I think we're 49th out of the 50 US states in terms of our education quality. So there, the public school education was kind of subpar. Um, so my junior year of high school, I moved away from home early to go live in a dorm and take college level classes. And so that in itself was a really cool experience because I was like, wow, like I could I can vibe with the college experience. I really liked living with other students and other young people. And we had a lot of fun there. But also I got to study things that I think I wouldn't have gotten to study otherwise. And I had opportunities that I wouldn't have had if I'd stayed home as hard as it was to 
family and especially my mom. My mom was ill at the time that I had moved out um, and I was her primary. I was one of, we like had worked it out, but up until then I had been one of her primary caretakers. Um, but so yeah, I got to take classes on like folk music and acoustics where I learned the physics and the science of sound, but then you apply it to your musical performance to make your sound better and you get to build your own instrument. And I got to do a research project, like my first research project, um, because I went to that school and they had part of the curriculum was you had to do like a thesis project to graduate. So I think a really big thing that helped my college application was I did research very early on. But also I think the biggest thing is, um, I feel like a lot of people try to just do everything regardless of if they like it or not. But um, part of what I think helped is part of, like I moved away from home to pursue the things that I was excited about. Um, and I took classes and I did things like in clubs, like I was in the robotics club and I did this research project and they were all things that I was really excited to do and things that I cared about. Like my research project tied back into something to do with my hometown, which had a lot of meaning to me. Um, and so I think, yeah, those are the big things I do is just like, and for students, I always tell them, you know, don't just do something to fill your resume or an application, do something because you really care about it because that passion and that like intent is gonna come out. Um, and I think that schools see that. Yeah, so what was the project about that you did in your hometown? Yeah, so um, the, and this was like my first research project. So this kind of eventually kind of, it led me towards the path that I am on now doing research as a PhD. So it's kind of wild that that, um, I didn't realize it then, but that was a pretty big thing in my education in my life. But um, it was, what I did was I used Arkansas grown agricultural waste products like soybeans and rice hulls to create an environmentally friendly um, and uh, biosurfactant and using a more economically feasible, like cheaper process. So surfactants are used in everything from like medicine to manufacturing, um, but most of them are used, use it, are um, produced using petroleum and petrochemicals, which is problematic both from an environmental standpoint because we're like, we're, create, we're using the petroleum or they're made with palm seed oil, which is also bad for the environment because we're cutting down palm trees to make these surfactants. Um, whereas where I grew up in Arkansas, we would, there, there were times, like we grow, I think the most rice um, of, and like soybeans, like we, we're an agricultural state. We grow a lot of these products and then we have a lot of the waste products. And most of the waste products are burned, which is again, bad for the environment. Um, because there's like, especially rice hulls, there's really nothing you can do with them. So it was cool mm -hmm. to find that there was this product that you could make out of it. And part of how that tied back to my hometown is like I said, we're an agricultural state and that is something that my town produced a lot of um, and the surrounding area. However, um, uh, when the recession hit and a lot of companies went out of business, um, I saw that impact you know, my, the economy in my town, I saw that impact my friends as parents. Like I saw friends as parents when I was in grade school, lose their jobs. And that was a scary time. So part of the motivation behind the project was we have this waste product in Arkansas. You'd have to build a factory in my hometown and in the state of Arkansas to produce this surfactant that people need. So it was a way to potentially bring industry back into my home state and into my hometown. And then as a follow-up on the project, that was my junior year, my senior year, I did a follow-up to that project and found the surfactant I made, you could actually um, refine it to make biodiesel. So that's another use you could have for that surfactant I made. Yeah, the, is biodiesel I understood. So what, was, what is the first thing you made out of that waste? Yeah, so surfactant is this substance that lowers the, um, that reduces, that lowers the surface tension of a liquid. So it's kind of think like soap. Um, it okay. makes it so that you can suspend air in like a liquid, like a bubble, or you can suspend other media in a substance. It's kind of like uh, how paint pigments are in paint. That happens because of surfactants. And it's used in medical uses. Like for instance, if premature, 
babies can't breathe, then their lungs are usually treated with some kind of a surfactant because it lowers the surface tension of the mucus and the liquid in their lungs and allows them to breathe more easily. Okay, okay, I got it, got it. Yeah. So like, why did you study at Stanford? What did I study? So I, my senior year of high school, I had started getting really interested into physics, um, but I also through doing robotics had really been into engineering and both physics and mechanical engineering were two fields that called to me. Um, so I think I was lucky. I got to start taking college classes early on, which then kind of allowed me to get more insight into what I enjoyed. But when I went to Stanford, I ended up like, it was for a lot of my first and part of my second year, I wasn't really sure. I was like, oh, do I want to go with physics? Do I want to go with mechanical engineering? Because I liked both of them for very different reasons. And that's part of what led me to my major. I was talking to some upperclassmen friends. And I will always recommend that younger students make friends with the upperclassmen because they are, first of all, a lot of fun. Um, they know a ton of like things that you don't, whether it be, hey, like here's a cool way, here are cool classes to take, here's a, like an easy way to enroll or here are like secrets of that to like fun places to hang out on campus and great food places around. Like always make friends with upperclassmen um, if you can, but one of my upperclassmen friends was like, oh, like, you know that there is a major called engineering physics, right? And I was like, no, wait, what? So I learned more about it and I found out, hey, I could actually, it's a very like modular um, field of study. So I could kind of design my own major to fit what I was interested in, which was really, um, that was really important to me. And also I could shuffle it around um, with the classes because I could either take the classes in the engineering department or the physics department. So that gave me a lot of flexibility. And it also allowed me to be able to study abroad in undergrad, which is something that was really important to me to get to do. So like, uh, as far as I know, half of the undergraduate students at MIT study computer science. Mm -hmm. So like, was there a temptation to you? Like, did your friends suggest to take computer science? I'm yeah, I my because all of the engineering majors at Stanford are required to take a, a computer science course. So I did take one and I really enjoyed it. It was a really it might be one of my favorite classes. It was super well taught. The professor was amazing. And I'd say that the um, the assignments they gave us to do were like mini projects were really, really fun, like legitimately. Yeah. So like uh, I asked this question because, you know, I also did diploma in mechanical engineering after yeah. passing grade 10. So now, now I'm thinking of, of doing undergraduate. So like some of the friends are like, okay, you should take computer science to that. And I'm mm -hmm. like, oh, I, I did my diploma in mechanical engineering. And like afterwards, they're like, okay, don't worry, you will learn eventually. And like the future is in mechanical engineering. So I, I'm like kind of like, Confused, what should I take? Computer science or mechanical engineering? I enjoyed mechanical engineering when I learned in, in diploma. Yeah. Yeah. So after meeting you, like you are doing like uh, doing that PhD in mechanical engineering. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm doing my PhD in mechanical engineering, but I'd say nowadays, like coding comes into everything, like especially. But something I found, like in my physics research, because that's part of how I figured out what I wanted to get my PhD in is doing research in both of my disciplines. Um, every, every field of research in STEM requires coding to some extent now. Uh, it's just a matter of certain people who study different disciplines have varying like mm -hmm. style in doing it. So I'd say the computer scientists, like they make beautiful code, they should like make beautiful code that's like good to read and well-documented and stuff, whereas some other research in fields I've done, like where coding practices aren't really taught in their major, like their codes kind of just, however, maybe it doesn't run as efficiently or like it's still, it gets the job done. But I would definitely encourage people to take um, at least an intro level coding class, just because like right now in my PhD, like I'm not doing a PhD in computer science, I'm doing it in mechanical engineering, but so many aspects of coding come into it, whether it's doing numerical methods and data analysis or running simulations, which given the fact we're in a pandemic now, a lot of the work is computational. Um, I think it's a good move to at least study some CS. Yeah. So like, what is your topic of research in PhD? Oh, so my, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm gonna have some tea, my throat's a little dry. So my, 
the la the research that my labs do, I'm co-advised. So two labs are um, providing me resources and guidance in my research. But um, my current field of research is in DNA nanotechnology, which was kind of a pivot from what my previous research was. A lot of my research before had been in, oof, oof, I actually like, I'd done a lot of different types of research because I wasn't sure what it was that I wanted to yeah. study and the only way to know is to try stuff, right? Mm -hmm. um, so my previous research had primarily been in different forms of electronics. Um, so DNA nanotechnology was a bit of a pivot, but it's also such a cool field and it's a really new field. Like, I think that the field itself is only about 14 years old, which is pretty young on the sliding scale of um, scientific disciplines. And it's so young that a lot of the things that we're doing are new, like even the software that we're making to visualize and simulate these structures we're making is completely new. So like, it's really cool to be a part of that. Um, and what DNA origami is, is, um, so yeah, you like might be thinking, oh, but Taryn, you're a mechanical engineer. Why are you doing stuff with DNA? Well, the whole, the whole purpose of the field and what we're trying to do is we are trying to use DNA and other um, bi molecular structures as a building material which is really, really cool because DNA, we've studied it. We know well the different material properties of it. And once you know the material properties of something, it's like aluminum, it's like steel, it's like you know wood. You can build things out of it if you know how it's gonna behave. Yeah, so like recently I, I read it in newspaper in that they're trying to build like memory in DNA, like use DNA as a memory card, something like that, so. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of interesting, no? So, so suppose you take like if your major is mechanical engineering in undergraduate, can you change it to like computer science or like biotechnology in in graduation in in masters? Um, like, I think it it really depends on the school and the program that you're in. So, I'm sure that if you really like say if you went to school to get a PhD in like mechanical engineering and you decide partway through that you wanna to switch to computer science, like I'm sure there's a way to, um, I'm sure that there's a way to do that switch. I'm, but like, yeah, I basically, I think that it would depend on the school. Some schools have a lot more flexibility amongst their departments. Um, but with most of the PhD programs I applied to, you apply to a certain department. So I applied to CMU as someone who wanted to be a mechanical engineering student. So if I wanted to switch, I think I would either have to work it out internally or maybe I'd have to reapply to a different school. Um, because usually by the time, I think you like by the time you get to PhD, they want, because it's such a long, time commitment and the professors are essentially hiring you as a long time research assistant. So because your PhD, they last from like five years, I think is about average. Some of them could go up. To um, so I think they usually want to know that you're gonna stick at least in the department for that long. But say like you could totally get a master's in one discipline and then switch for your PhD. I think it's just a matter of does your narrative and does your reasoning for switching make sense? And can you convey that to the department in such a way that they're okay with you changing? But again, it's it's totally gonna depend on the school. Yeah, so why did you choose CM, CMU for PhD? So this one is 100% because of my advisors and the research. Um, so when I applied to my PhD programs, I knew that a big thing that would make a difference for me would be like, well, many factors where I would be living, the department climate and culture, um, who, what my lab culture would be like, what the professor was like, the research I'd be doing. Um, the research is a really, really big factor in choosing a PhD program and a lab, but it's far from the only factor because you're going to be there for so long. You have to look at it, you know, holistically with will you like, even if, will you be happy living in the city that the school is in? So I applied to a bunch of different schools and went and to the ones I got accepted to, I traveled to their visit weekends to as many of the visit weekends as I could go. Cause the only way to really tell if you could 
if you would want to go somewhere, I think is to visit and really feel it out in person. Like that's part of when I decided to go to Stanford, the visit weekend and being there in person really sealed that decision for me. Um, so part of it's like when I got accepted to the school, the professor who is my current advisor reached out and was like, hey, like, let's talk on the phone. And we had a great conversation. She told me about her research. It was just as much me interviewing her as her interviewing me. And it just felt like a really good fit. Like I, after that conversation, honestly, I was just blown away and very impressed by her. And I was like, I want like you to be my mentor um, to myself. I didn't tell her I was still like looking at other schools. Um, yeah. And what really did it for me was the visit. So I came to CMU and I visited the department and I really liked the structure of the department and the program. And I loved the people who would be in my cohort because who you go through the program with really makes a big difference. Um, you know, you're gonna be there to support each other. And I really loved the people I would be working with in my lab. I got to spend time with them, you know, away from the professor and get to know the students. And I loved the students in my labs. Um, and the two women who my advisors, like my professors, I just was so blown away by them. They are two people that I think I would like to be at. Like, they're at a point in their life that I think I would want to be at, you know, where they're doing ridiculously cool research. They're mentoring students. They're making such impact not only in their field, both in terms of their research and in terms of the culture that they're helping shape of women and people of color in STEM. Um, so, yeah, what really sold it for me is the advisors. I'm 100% going to CMU because I wanted to work with those professors. Yeah, I suppose you go there, right? And they change the school, like press, <laughs> professor go to another school. Like, can they do like, like, like are they on their contract basis? Suppose they have to stay there for five years, like on the professors are there on contract basis or like they can leave the school whenever <laughs> they want. I think it, it depends. Um, so if the professor has tenure at the school, usually they're going to stay there because, you know, they have job security and good benefits and like a good salary um, and dedicated money for their research. One of my professors is up for um, tenure, which means that if she doesn't get it, she might be asked to go to a different school or they might like have her try again. So that's definitely a possibility. It really helps that because I'm co-advised, um, if one of them were to go to a different school, I have the option to stay here with the other one or move with that one. Um, but that's, you know, so I'm, I'm pretty happy in the situation I'm in now. So I would hope that doesn't happen. Yeah, you just hope. No. Yeah, that's, that's definitely a possibility that PhD students face is if your professor leaves, like, do you go with your professor? Do you stay at the school and try to find a different one? Like, that's a very real possibility. I mean, if you want to go with the professor, can you go with how would the transfer process will how would transfer process will work? Um, I'm not really sure because I don't know many I don't think I know any people that's happened to, but then again, I'm very new as a PhD student. This is only my first year. Um, but I would assume that that's the case and what if that's the case, then the professor would give you the option or they might be like, hey, you you know, if you want to keep doing this research that like if if you want to keep doing this research, you should really like move with me. Um, I think if that were the case, maybe the other university would like, they, th that would probably have to be something where you'd have to work it out with the professor. Um, are you gonna take me with you to your new lab? Will I have funding, which is a really big deal because without funding, you don't get a stipend, which grad students, you, that's like your salary, you need it to live on. Um, yeah, again, I think that's probably gonna be on a case by case basis. I, I don't really know generally how that would work. Yeah. So where did you complete your master's? Mm. I haven't completed my master's degree yet. So something that you can do for PhD programs is you can either get a master's beforehand or you can come directly into the PhD. And depending on the program and the school, you can either get a master's along the way um, or you can just do the PhD. Like I'm in a program in which I think for the Right to, to just get a PhD, I have to complete eight courses and then do my thesis defense and everything. But if I want a master's in addition to my PhD, I take two more classes of certain types and then I'll get a PhD and a master's. 
Yeah. So yeah. like you were at Stanford. So how is your difficulty is it to like do masters in same university? Like for example, Stanford. Um, the difference. Could you repeat the question, please? Like you were at Stanford for undergraduation, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Easy or difficult to do masters at Stanford? Like you. Like how would would, would the application process work? Like if you are undergraduate student at Stanford mm -hmm. and you want to do masters, so you will automatically be transferred, right? Or like yeah, you do, the, yeah. yeah, I understand. Um, so there was something at Stanford called a co-terminal degree. And it was something that a lot of people I know did one. Um, my significant other and many of my friends did one. But what it is, is it's a combined undergrad and master. So you do your undergrad for four years. Um, but instead of then at the end of four years applying for a master's and starting like a program over, the co-terminal degree kind of um, blurs the line, but like it kind of blurs the end and the start between the two. So you apply, I think in your junior, you can apply in your junior or senior year to a specific co-term program at Stanford. Um, like if I decided to do that and I considered it, I probably would have applied for the mechanical engineering co-term. And then what you do is while you're finishing up your undergraduate classes, you start taking master's classes. So then instead of doing four years of undergrad and like two or three years of a master, you do like four years of undergrad and like one to two years of a master's degree. Um, but so, yeah, I think there, there was that way that as a Stanford undergrad, you could apply and do a master's degree on campus. Um, and the different co-terms in different departments had, um, had different acceptance rates. So it was very program dependent. Um, but I do know friends as well who applied to master's programs from the school. I think the difference there is with co-terms, they only, with co-terms, they are only looking at a pool of Stanford undergrads, whereas with a normal master's, they're looking at the pool of everyone who's applying to that master's program. And like I said, this is probably gonna be, this was just the case at Stanford, like it'll probably be different for other schools. Yeah, so like you have to apply for that program, no? Like in starting of your junior year, or senior year at high school or in at high school no right you in know, college like, uh, in, you're okay, yeah, suppose, you, yeah suppose if you are a regular student you did not apply so after finishing your bachelor's in stanford so how is your difficulty is it to get into like master's degree as a regular student um into a master's program as a regular student after undergrad or yeah, after integration. So you suppose completed and afterwards you want to do a master's. Um, after completing. So I don't know. I, Stanford was, I think Stanford applicants are pretty competitive for most programs just because the, the um, majors and the, like the study there was pretty rigorous, at least in my major. Granted, my major was, um, it would because it was combined with physics and engineering. It was more intense, I think, than the standard or the average was. Um, so I was a pretty competitive applicant. Um, I just know less about because I only applied to PhD programs. I know slightly less about applying to different master's programs. So, so there would be competition, right? It, you you are not not going to get directly into that. Yeah, you're not going to get directly in. There's definitely competition because I mean, there are also other like I like I'm definitely biased, but I because I really enjoyed going to Stanford. I thought it was like a great school, but there are other like um, there are other amazing students from other great schools and everyone does something. Most people who are applying to very competitive programs do something um, unique or something cool that does make them competitive or they're doing some cool type of research or maybe they've done some interesting like type of outreach. Um, so yeah, just because you get a degree from a really amazing school, it's not like, it's not like a golden pass into any program. You still have to put the work into applying and the work into making sure your GPA, your test scores, your essays are competitive. Like I, when I was applying to my programs, I put a ridiculous amount of work into my applications. Like I didn't just BS them, um, pardon language, and then like send them in. I 
think I, so the PhD applications were due December 15th last year, actually, like a year from around this time is when I was turning everything in. But I think I started them in like July or August. Like you have to start pretty early. I gave a lot of thought to which schools I thought I wanted to apply to. I looked through the websites and found professors I was into. Like there are a lot of steps to applying to graduate programs. I feel like not everyone's super aware of. Um, but yeah, anyway, like to answer your question, just because you go to a really great school and get a degree from there doesn't mean that you have a pass into any program you want. You still have to put the work in and you have to like everything that you've done. It doesn't really mean like it's only at means as much as how well you can communicate that to others. Like communication is a really important thing to me, especially science communication. Because if you do something awesome, cool, but can you explain to others? Can you tell them why that's exciting and why they should care about it, you know? So, like, I was just wondering if student, uh, st undergraduate students at Stanford mm -hmm. get priority over other students, or, like, they have to go through the same process and, like, afterwards they get selected? They have to go through the same process as everyone. It might be the case that like because so, Stanford has that reputation of being a really amazing school and having a really difficult difficult programs especially in like engineering especially in CS especially in like physics and the sciences um it might be the case that your application gets more than one look or that a, a certain professor might be like oh I know because of the reputation of the school and this program that this student is very prepared for what I want to do but that's like if you're putting the preparation in throughout undergrad, I don't think in the application process, you, you don't get special treatment, but your where you went to school and the reputation of the school does make a difference. And I think that it will make you stand out a little. Yeah. But it ultimately comes down to what have you done that makes you, makes you noteworthy of that professor, like looking at your application. Yeah. So you st you stayed there like at Stanford for four years and like one mm -hmm. year at AMU. So what is your number one complaint about both of your schools? Number one complaint? Yeah. Okay. Well, hmm. I I admit my my for, this is my first semester at CMU and I have been starting my grad student career during COVID, which is an interesting time to say the least. I'd say my biggest, well, that's the thing is my biggest complaints I have about CMU are mostly just related around the pandemic. Like I wish I could go to campus more. I wish I could interact face to face with my professor. I wish that I could, um, like I'm, I wish that I could be in lab and doing stuff. So those aren't really, I don't know if I've been here quite long enough to have like complaints about the school yet. Cause most of my complaints are Oh, like situational, you know, in, in context, I wish that I could be on campus interacting with the other students in my cohort and starting research, um, which I know that's not really, I don't, that's not the greatest answer, but because these are very unique circumstances. Um, but yeah, I've heard other grad students complain about the Pittsburgh weather, but it just snowed today. So I'm kind of loving it. I will probably like it less the colder it gets, but um, right now it's pretty cool. My... I think my biggest complaint about Stanford, and based on what I'm hearing and finding out, it might be something similar for CMU, actually, um, is this thing called duck syndrome, um, which I don't know if you've, you've heard the term or are aware of what it is. Or... Duck or imposter syndrome. Yeah, 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 so like imposter syndrome. And also duck syndrome is this thing where um, you know, like if you see ducks gliding on the water, they look like they're just gliding and it's the easiest thing. But if you look under the water, they're paddling really hard and they're struggling. Like one, something one that like, huh? I interviewed 10 students from Stanford and they would every like most of them gave this example. There is a duck and paddling. Yeah, so yeah, like, yeah. It's just like your professors also give that example. Like, yeah, like that. MIT students also talk about duck syndrome, but they don't give example like that <laughs> duck is going on and passing, right? Yeah. So, like, yeah, so what, what is the reason behind it? Like, so do, do professors at your college talk a lot about it? Well, I think um, 
at Stanford, they had something called the Stanford Resilience Project. And also there was like a student academic skills center. And they talked about it a lot because it's something that I think is detrimental to students. Like hell, it was detrimental to me for a while because with duck syndrome, it's like everyone around you trying to like, even if they're struggling, they pretend they're not, you know, even if, and I've experienced this firsthand, I feel like, especially in STEM and science and physics and engineering, it's very common, especially in students to, even if you have no idea what the teacher just said, and even if you're struggling in the class, you're like, oh, like it, students are like, oh, that exam was so easy. I'm doing great when really they are secretly struggling. And it can make it, it can make an already difficult field and an already difficult major and an already like kind of isolating time really hard and it can make you feel alone. So not all, some, some professors at Stanford would talk about it. Others of them were not, others of them were, I don't know if they, they just didn't talk about it, but there, I've definitely had professors before be like, this is so easy. And looking at the board of what they just did, it's like, that is not easy. Like that is really, really hard stuff. And I think that's something that's just very common in academia in general. You're in this like academic bubble with other people who know the language of what you're talking about, who know like the background and the science of your field or even like the literature, like if you're in English or like, you know, the politics, if you're a poli sci majors, you're with other people who have made it their life mission to study this. So you forget that not everyone knows what you're talking about. And some people are seeing this for the first time. So no, there were some professors uh, there. I haven't run into it yet, but again, I've only taken like two classes at CMU. Like I've, and one of, one of my professors is absolutely amazing oh my gosh she like might be one of the best she's also my pi and she's also a great professor but um yeah so some stanford professors would say oh this is easy and like this and that and it's like they forget that it's not easy they forget that once upon a time they were learning it for the first time too and i think the professors that are remember that and remember what it was like being a student are some of the best professors because they get like how to explain it to the students who are hearing it for the first time um, and they get kind of where we're coming from and what we're feeling. Um, yeah. So yeah, no, I definitely think students should be open when they're struggling. Um, Cause otherwise, you know, yeah, odds are like, if you don't understand it, you know, don't have imposter syndrome. If odds are, if you're sitting in this room and you worked your ass off to get there and you, you are worthy and you deserve to be there. If you don't understand what's happening, odds are no one in the room understands either. Yeah. So uh, I have two questions. How could you fix the How could you fix Dakor in post syndrome? And second, what class does your favorite professor teach at AMU? So my favorite professor. I mean, she teaches a class that's kind of. She told me to take it because she's like, this will give you a lot of background for your research. But the class is called um, Nano Manufacturing Using DNA Origami Techniques or something like like. But it's a class that's essentially about my research and it's teaching me the simulation tools I need but she's she just explains things in a really fun way like the class itself is really fun because she also has activities like in ways that we can like to help us learn because the things we're dealing with you can't see them you can't see DNA and most of us are learning from home now so we can't like go look under a microscope or run like cool labs to see what she's talking about so she's come up with like cool activities using pipe cleaners and like magnetic toys and even had us make up this little rig to kind of show us what atomic force microscopy is like. Um, so I really appreciate that, especially in this time when learning is so different than what we're all used to. She's gone the extra mile to make the class not only super informative, but a lot of fun, you know. And in terms of how to fix imposter and duck syndrome, I think one is like honesty, like Heck, I've definitely had points, I've struggled. Like, dude, getting a physics degree at Stanford, it's hard. Like, I have failed exams. I have been so stressed sometimes that I had trouble sleeping. But I think a really big thing to help you through, like, everyone's going to go through a time like that, especially in more intense majors. Um, and I think looking back, something that really helped me get through it were the people, like finding a community of people. And for me, I found that as a community of like women and women of color in my majors and in physics, 
um, and good friends. So I think ways that you can help imposter syndrome and duck syndrome, well, they're kind of separate, they're different things. But with duck syndrome, be honest about when you're struggling and go get help, get help from your professor. If they're a good professor and if your TAs and the teaching team is good, odds are like they will help you. If you don't understand something, get help from them. Like be honest with your classmates and maybe like get help with classmates. I always love studying with a study group because you learn from each other. If you don't understand something and someone else does, like you can trade knowledge and you can help each other understand and you can commiserate when you don't understand. So finding friends and people to work with in classes, like I'm in a class, one class right now with a friend and one class with where I didn't know anyone in and the difference in them is night and day. Just having people to be in your corner, people to be on your team really makes a big difference. Um, also self-care. I, no matter how hard a class is, it is not worth sacrificing your health. It is not worth sacrificing your sanity because things in life are temporary, both the good and the bad things, you know, and something that someone told me in undergrad that really helped me put things into perspective is like, and it was right after I had gotten the worst grade I have ever gotten in my life on an exam. And I felt so crappy about myself because also there were some like some guys over in like some guys over in my class talking about how, oh yeah, whoa, we got like such good grades and this test was so easy. And I was like, that was really not easy. That was hard. Um, but yeah, this, yeah. Hmm? This, but yeah, like, like yeah, students at Stanford like are from different backgrounds. So mm -hmm. in your class, you might have students who like won gold medal or silver medal in physics Olympiads in high mm -hmm. school. So for them, it might be a little easier, no? And like for if your uh, interest is biology in high school, for example, so going to Stanford and taking classes of physics. Mm -hmm. Like you have to work that you work your rest of and in starting you might not understand. So yeah. everybody at different level, like in past year. So exactly. Of, yeah. Of yeah. That. Everyone comes in with a different background and everyone comes in like everyone's got superpowers that they can bring to the world. And some people, cool, their superpowers that they take tests well or that they know physics well, or some people know biology, or some people are so musically gifted and some people can like write and understand but like everyone has a superpower that they bring to the world um and just like everyone's is different so just like accept and like okay what am I trying to say here I guess I would say for the people who like don't don't make don't lift yourself up by bringing others down like recognize that you might have a stronger background in something than someone else but odds are that person's super great at something that you're gonna really struggle with um so just like be a decent and chill human to those around you and don't try to bring negativity to it or bring people down and honestly call those people on it like sometimes i've called people in my on it and been like hey the way you're talking about this is really not cool it's bringing others in the room down like and sometimes that has been received positively sometimes it hasn't but if you don't say anything it's not gonna nothing's gonna change sometimes it's like better to bring that up and start those conversations albeit like in a respectful way you know not in a negative mean way but like starting a conversation can make a very big difference um and definitely find your team of people find your tribe find your support network because that is what's going to get you through the difficult times in college and take care of yourself like more than anything you know like it's like my friend told me um in undergrad it's like hey yeah this sucks right like Sure, you did really bad on that exam, but is that going to matter to you in a month, six months? Is it going to matter to you in a year or 10 years or 20 years? And I, I couldn't even tell you what year of college that I failed that exam. Like at the time, it felt like it was the end of the world and it was a crappy thing. But now, like I, I couldn't even tell you what class that was in. It matters so little to me now. So just gaining perspective that your life your life goes beyond undergrad and your life goes beyond high school and your life goes, even my life will go on beyond my PhD. So putting things into perspective, like really helps too. As you mentioned, like some people try to bring other people down and sometimes it can, like somebody is trying to bring you down. It can lift you up sometimes. Suppose yeah. you are you are lazy and like you are not doing well in the exams and somebody is mm -hmm. trying to 
like bring you down so you are like <laughs> okay then if you know i'm going to show that this guy you know sometimes it helps but i don't show this and like at some times it helps yeah 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 and that's yeah. one yeah having your support network is good also i will like if you are really down and really struggling like a lot of campuses have like to varying degrees of quality but a lot of campuses have psychological centers um and i think that's something that should be normalized and it's not something to be ashamed of like i know many people who just cuz life gets hard sometimes whether because like they've had family issues while they're in undergrad and undergrad is hard enough especially at a school like stanford you know like it is never a bad thing and it is never something to be ashamed of to ask for help you know whether that be from friends family your professors with like school or like just going to um going to a therapist just so you have a space to talk like it is never something to be ashamed of to get help and to ask for help and give yourself what you need yeah so you know i spoke to few like few students at cambridge mm-hmm. and oxford university and like students at stanford and mit so what i found out right that students come from different backgrounds in us right so application mm-hmm. like application process is different so like some students struggle like like some classes are in, everybody has to take those classes and suppose you did not take that classes in high school so it you might mm-hmm. feel difficult but in uk like you are supposed to sub- study one subject to like as far i know so mm-hmm. students in those universities don't feel duck syndrome or imposter imposter syndrome like students in mi to harvard do like as of when they do not so what do you think about it cuz like cuz they understand what teacher is trying to explain to them cuz they have studied that subject in high school then mm-hmm. yeah i think that just that just speaks to in the us how much the education quality varies by state and like i said like i struggled with things like i grew up in a state where the education system wasn't the greatest and part of the reason why i think i was able to do well and help there were even some classes in stanford where i excelled in them like actually there were a decent amount got to give myself some credit you know um that was because i went to that um i went to that school and i moved away from home which was a sacrifice but it allowed me to get a better education than i could have hoped for where i was originally living um and i think it's sad that yeah i think it's a sad thing but it really just points to like the disparity um of the edu- like how the education system in the us better serves some individuals than it does others and in particular you know people of color people living below the poverty line they just don't have access to as good of an education as say like upper class individuals who can go to like private schools for their whole lives and i don't know there needs to be some kind of a social reform cuz i don't know i i believe that education is something that everyone should be able to do and i believe that that's the part of why i'm like really passionate about um outreach is because i think no one should be kept from doing what they want what makes them happy you know because of things they can't help because of like being who they are um yeah yeah, yeah. so i applied to ib schools in us and i got a little surprised that their fees is like 40000 dollar to 60000 dollar like good yeah. ib school yeah so i don't think like a middle class family would uh, can afford it like they earn that much money in one year so how can they afford the tuition fees of their students yeah. so what do you say about it like how how like us can improve their quality of education well first of all these the ed- college prices are criminally high um and they've only gotten higher which is just oh my gosh that's just it's crappy but um I know that some schools like an advice that I've both I got and that I have like had confirmed by other friends is people who are low like low income students might think that they they might think that they won't apply to schools like Stanford or MIT or Harvard because they're like oh my family doesn't like have enough money but the thing is a lot of those schools like a lot of the best schools offer um 
need-based scholarships, which means that they'll look at how much money your family makes, and then they'll give you however much money they think like you need to be able to go there. Um, and so actually, if people, like the more, the closer to low income that you are, the more I would encourage you to apply to some of the best schools because those are the schools that are most likely to give you um, scholarships specifically because you are low income. Um, as well, like apply to a bunch of fellowships, scholarships, because um, you never know, like there, there are scholarships out there. And again, it's just, it, college is criminally expensive which yeah, I mean, sucks and it, especially it, sucks for the middle class it especially sucks for middle class students because like their parents might n might make enough that they're unable to like get as many scholarships but yeah in college you might get scholarships you want like stanford harvard and mit and all other colleges give scholarships mm -hmm. and scholarships. i'm talking about high schools like in oh, high schools high. i don't think high schools in us offer that much scholarships to students and schools, i don't think they do no uh, rich background, he can go to a good Ivy school or like a good, good school, right? He would have access to good lab facilities, good teachers and like, so how would a poor student or like a student from poor background, like, would like, what would he do? Uh, yeah, I don't know. Because it's kind of like the system is set up in a way that will make it harder for you them to do that but get creative maybe and realize that like what am I trying to say yeah I would say get creative because it is and know that it is not your fault it is something that is really fucked up about society um, and really unfair but like for instance the school I went to for high school it was it had wonderful facilities and it was a unique case, but it was completely free. All I had to do was get accepted there. And it was, my parents didn't have to pay anything. I think I had to pay $10 as an electricity fee when, cause I brought my laptop. Um, but yeah, I would say look for opportunities like that. Maybe if there's a local community college, um, if there's like a local community college, see if you can get some kind of a scholarship there and start taking college classes early take classes online like because if you're not going to the best school do everything you can to try to learn and also there is no shame in being a non-traditional student like it's entirely possible to go to a community college or a local school and then after a few years transfer to a better university and get some scholarship money that way but honestly make the primary focus your learning because that will help you and and like learning and finding and figuring out for yourself what fulfills you like what excites you what makes you want to like what what gives you some direction because that really it'll be more work but that'll help you have a direction to work towards and also like yeah applying to all kinds of scholarships honestly never be afraid to ask people for money like you will be surprised um, on where you can find money for things. Like when I did my study abroad, I straight up like applied to a bunch of random scholarships. I also worked like part-time jobs. I always had a part-time job through undergrad and worked during the summer. So I saved and budgeted as well. Um, and just randomly talking to people in different offices at my university um, and being like, hey, I'm doing this. Do you know what scholarship opportunities might be? And that's at a university level, but honestly, internet searches, because um, I know some high school counselors might not be the best. They might not be, tell you all the resources available, but really put the research in because even if they're hard to find, there are resources out there and it just sucks that the, the work would have to be on them to do it. Um, but you know what, I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to not be a bummer here. There are ways to do it, it's just gonna be harder. Um, yeah, so good suggestion, like you can, I think magnet schools and public schools in US are free yeah. and some of them are really good. I know that like, students yeah. who like studied in public school and like got admitted into MIT or Stanford, yeah. just try to get in, like in a good high school. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you private schools, so like I think public schools, some of, some of public schools are really good. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think that was a good suggestion. So two questions like, so who was your mentor in a in the high school? And second, the mentor in your PhD does she put videos online or like does that your college put videos online like MIT do? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So right now we're doing online. Well, it depends. Some classes are in person. It's like a hybrid model. So classes that they consider to be low risk um, can be on campus or classes that need certain facilities, like a lot of, like say wood shop classes or classes that need to be in the machine shop on campus um, or certain research classes are there, but with very heavy precautions and regulations. Um, And then some classes like mine, where it's just a lecture class and you do assignments, they're all virtual. Um, And what was your first question again? Oh, mentors, mentors. Um, Well, I'd say, two of my, I feel like I got my, my mentor who really made a difference in my life. I didn't get until undergrad, but I'd say two people who were my may, I don't know if they were mentors, but they were definitely my biggest supporters and cheerleaders in high school were my mom and one of my best friends. Um, and they're the ones where they like, they saw what I was capable of and what I could do long before I saw it for myself. And I feel like that's important for everyone to have is to have people who see you for who you are and also appreciate, like they appreciate you for who you are and also see what you can become and see all that you can do. Like even when you don't, because everyone forgets, we're only human. Um, Like they were the, like my mom and my friend, who eventually became my significant other, but that's a longer story. Um, They were the ones who like, they're like, we believe you can get into Stanford and you belong there and you, that'll be a really good move for you. And you'll never be able to, they're like, you know, come on, like you got to at least try. Like they, yeah, they like supported me. They were like my cheerleaders. They thought I could do it when I didn't. Um, And were there like when I needed to talk or also, you know, to throw ideas off of, or just like, mess around with um so yeah that was in high school you can support yourself up to a significant time right sometimes you get low grades on the test you would be like mm-hmm. okay am i capable enough and in that time in hard times they will they will be come handy you know they will lift you up and just yeah put a good space okay so you are good to go for the next adventure or like next test or like next day yeah, exactly. Like I, the people in your life and the people you surround you with are really important because the people, like the people you surround yourself with can either lift you up or they can tear you down and you want people that lift you up. And I mean, I know I have had both, like I'm, yeah, I have had both throughout my life. And let me tell you, like nothing, like nothing beats good people who are in your corner and who, you know, have your back and who, I mean, that that's a trade off with things, though, is like relationships and friends like they are work like my friends are there for me. That means like you got to be there for them, too. But I you, that's one of the most important things I think about college, high school life is you've got to find those people for you. Uh, so like everyone have those people who are in their sport and like who opposes them. So what to find to work. So last question for you. Mm-hmm. It was really nice talking to you. Yeah, about it was awesome by- talking to you. Yeah. So what advice would you give to 11th grade you? 11th grade me? Mm. Ooh. What would, that's, ooh. I think one piece of advice I would give 11th grade me is, I might have said earlier, but yes, things will be all right. You know, like, not only will things be all right, but I think 11th grade me was very like when things happened, both good things and bad things. And I think this is true of like a lot of people in high school. Stuff feels like the greatest thing that ever happened and stuff feels like the end of the world. Like everything is big. But it's like I said, like your life is so much longer than high school. And that's like a responsibility and a big thing because you have to like plan past high school and past college. But also it's kind of a cool thing. Like you're not gonna like 
you're going to go on to do so much more incredible stuff beyond what you're doing then. Um, and something else I would tell my 11th grade self is I was very concerned and worried. Like I wanted to have everything figured out. I wanted to have a plan. And that's something that was like for a while, like I had to learn to be okay with the journey and okay with not necessarily knowing what the next step is at the time because you figure it out as part of the journey. And, you know, how can I phrase this? I guess, yeah, 11th grade me was very concerned with wanting to have things figured out and wanting to know what I wanted to do and where I wanted to go to school and stuff. And I think I would tell them, hey, focus on the now as well. Like it's good to plan for the future, but your life is what happens in the like if you if you spend your entire life planning for future things then your life is what happens in the days that you spend looking forward to the other things like your life is what's happening now so yes look forward yes aim for the high things that you're aiming for but also just be okay with the fact that it's a journey and you know be okay with failure. Just be okay in the day and enjoy that day because you only live it once. Yeah. So like in India, one that quote is famous. Journey is more, more interesting than goals achieving goals. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it was really nice talking to you. I want, like, I did not ask much questions about Stanford because like, the conversation, conversation got going about your life and like what you do. Yeah, no, there's awesome getting to talk to you as well and if you have any other questions i mean feel free to reach out i things like this really helps me when i was a younger student and had no idea what i was doing um and so i'm always happy to let students know first of all that they're doing a heck of a lot better than they think they are and it give them some insight yeah. yeah i suppose sometimes you are confused but if you like sometimes you are confused about something and if a student or like some other another student ask you about the same thing you will give advice to him and afterwards you will figure out okay oh, i just mm -hmm. wanted to do this yeah, yeah sometimes yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. good night to you yeah have a nice night i'm gonna reach out if you have any other questions it was good okay. talking to you yeah mm -hmm. Bye. Bye.